Okay, uh, let's get started. Um, on, be on behalf of the Griffiths Institute and Assured uh, Information Security and the NOR Advancement Center, I'd like to welcome you today to welcome you to today's lecture and education uh, series on the Fisher RF framework. Um, I'm Patrick Hurley. I'm a, a principal engineer here at the Griffiths Institute. And today our guest speakers are uh, Eric Thayer and Chris Ford um, from AIS. Um, Eric Thayer is a group lead for the systems analysis and exploitation group at uh, Shared Information Security. Eric uh, has over 20 years of experience in cyber security field. He has a degree focused on uh, computer security and localized training in uh, vulnerability identification, um, exploit development, and reverse engineering. Mr. Thayer has spent much of his career as a lead engineer performing security assessments and security related research for government agencies, state organizations, and commercial entities. Um, serving as the voice of the offense, Mr. Thayer has conducted security assessments for software systems, networks, embedded systems such as uh, smartphones, SCADA equipment, automobiles, radios, air, air, air vehicles. Um, Chris Poor is a senior computer engineer for the uh, Systems Analysis and Exploitation, Exploitation Group at Assured Information Security. Chris uh, has nearly 13 years experience at AIS characterizing and exploiting cyber systems with a focus on RF enabled devices. His experience includes reverse engineering of RF protocols, forensic testing um, of cybersecurity systems, Discovery, discovering vulnerabilities in wireless systems, gaining access to systems via RF and administering RF collection events using a variety of hardware. He is the primary developer of the Fisher software and has been modifying it since uh, 2014. Uh, Mr. Poor actively searches for new RF targets and the latest software defined radio and data analysis tools to integrate into the Fisher uh, framework. Okay, so we'll get started in a couple seconds here, but if you have any questions, um, please use the chat to ask the questions as, as you have them. And at the end of the presentation and demo, we'll, uh, we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. And also please stay on mute. Um, so without anything further to do, we'll turn it over to uh, uh, Eric Thayer. Thank you, Pat, for that uh, wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm, I'm Eric there, senior engineer and uh, principal at Shared Information Security. I'm accompanied today by, by Chris Poor, uh, another senior engineer and uh, visionary when it comes to, to dealing with this uh, Fissure framework. Um, so we're here today to talk about Fissure. It's, it's an RF framework that we've developed. Uh, it's an in-house tool. Uh, we'll introduce you to you know, who we are, what we do, uh, why we need uh, RF analysis tools, the sorts of challenges that are uh, presented by that, and then our actual fissure solution. We'll, uh, we'll talk through the, the solution, talk through how it works, and then give you a demonstration uh, against a couple interesting targets that are relevant to us. Uh, so uh, first, um, who are we? We are you know, engineers at Assured Information Security. We are security professionals, we're uh, cybersecurity researchers. Our job is to identify weaknesses in systems. We design, uh, we evaluate design, we evaluate implementation, and we assess whether or not hardware and software are built properly and securely. Uh, our goal, the reason that we do this, is to make the end product, to make the system secure. We verify that the system's secure, we detect issues before they're found by attackers, and we then develop or provide solutions to uh, the, either the, the, the parties involved or the parties responsible for making that. Uh, those solutions minimize risk, uh, they provide threat awareness, and uh, they give a, a mechanism or a means to mitigate the threat and to prevent compromise or, or exploitation. So if we're the security guys and we're looking at these embedded systems, I mean, that's, that's computer stuff, right? That, that doesn't really matter. Where, where's the RF come in? Well, it, the thing is, uh, cyber physical systems, all of these interesting components, these, these unmanned aerial systems, communications networks, and ICS or industrial control systems, they all have radios. There's radios everywhere. 
anything that says it's smart, anything that comes across as a, as a smart platform is connected. And those connections are what expose those systems to attacks. Those, those remote links, those remote access vectors are what we use to gain access, to inject commands, to take over control, and to influence the way that these, these systems and devices behave. So <clears throat> in order to do the analysis, in order to investigate these systems, analyze them, try to identify the vulnerabilities that exist, we have to have a process. We have an RF uh, enabled system analysis process. Uh, as we step through and we look at one of these target platforms, you know, we have to detect the presence of RF energy. We have to understand and characterize that signal and know what it is that's, that's actually out there and going through the air. And then we have to develop techniques to either uh, transmit or inject our own messages, our own data into that stream and, and craft custom payloads or messages. Now, stepping through that process, that gives us the ability to you know, understand what's going on, the, it, inject the data and actually conduct an attack. We have to then couple that with you know, our, our experience and our knowledge and our understanding of, of the underlying computer, uh, computer systems and that communications process to actually uh, compromise and, and gain access or exploit one of these systems. But that whole process has a number of challenges, right? So if we're dealing with radios, if we're dealing with primarily software-defined radios, that's, that's what we use most of the time. Uh, we also use some wireless cards and some other things. Uh, there's a number of different software dependencies, right? So all of these, all of these uh, tools, they have to have the proper software versions, you have to have the proper drivers, you have to have the proper firmware loaded onto the card. You know, there's, there's hardware compatibility and software update problems, you know, not only at the operating system level, but the application level, where sometimes things don't work right, or if you get the wrong, you know, if your configuration is wrong, it's, it's, it's a significant amount of, of lift to get one of these systems working and to get an SDR working or to get a, to get a, a wireless card working in a way that you can actually use it to, to target and attack some complex device. Uh, and we found ourselves regularly, you know, spooling up engineers, bringing them up to speed on how this software, how these hardware devices worked and, and providing, you know, background and, and, and support and making that work. And, and we found ourselves recreating a lot of uh, lost work or doing things over again, um, simply because, you know, we didn't have it or we didn't keep a copy of it from the previous time. So uh, we identified and, and developed a solution. Uh, it's an in-house laboratory tool that we use to enable rapid detection analysis and transmission of RF signals. We built it so it's modular, we can incorporate SDRs, we can incorporate different uh, wireless cards, different hardware, different tools, different things that we need to do our job. And then as we develop tools, as we uh, build capabilities for the software, we store everything within a repository. So we have you know, RF attacks, we have our attack tools that we can reuse, that we can you know, bring forward into another uh, analysis or another effort and leverage those as we, uh, as we progress forward. So this internal framework is uh, entitled, we've called it Fissure. Uh, it's a prototype tool. Uh, we use it to do most of our assessment in, internal. Um, Chris uses it for pretty much every task that he, uh, he conducts at the office. Um, it's a framework that has hooks that gives us the ability to detect and classify signals. We can tear the signal apart, look at the protocol, understand what's going on underneath it, and then craft attacks and, and craft um, exploits to target these devices and then automate that entire process. So we can then go through that and, and characterize that signal and, and, and perform that attack later on at a different time or, or against another system that looks similar. Um, this framework gives us a standardized interface. It gives us a way to bring in open source tools. It brings us, it, it gives us a way to bring in our own one-off tools and, and components that we want to add to it that we need to use to, to, to go through the assessment process and to look at these you know, complex RF enabled devices. So really what Fissure does is it, it enables workflow. It, it gives us a means to rapidly stand up a system uh, it's got a scripted install. It's got a standardized user interface. Um, you can pick the packages that you want to install and you're up and running and installed and running on a, a Linux box in, in a matter of you know, minutes to an hour, as opposed to fighting the libraries and dependencies and downloading them and, and doing all of those things, which sometimes takes a significant amount of time. Um, you know, we have the ability to store libraries to, uh, to to build our own libraries for attacks, to build our own protocol analysis tools and experimental algorithms and store those 
internal to the Fisher framework. Uh, it gives us the interface to the hardware, gives us the interface to the software, and it's all built on top of GNU Radio, right? So we can build our own GNU Radio modules, we can incorporate them in, we can store the flow graphs, we can reuse all of that. And uh, we've been using this, Chris has been developing and working on this for quite some time. So we have support for a number of different hardware devices. So we can take those flow graphs, we can apply them to the USRP, you know, a different a B210 or an X310 or, or even some of the, the 205 and the 205 minis will work through this framework as well. Um, he's, he's built it in a way that we can use the hack RFs and the blade RFs and even incorporate our own, you know, random 80211 adapters uh, that we've got out there for some of those attacks. So currently, uh, Fisher gives us the ability to work with the raw IQ data, right? You can, you can power Fisher up, you can do a basic capture, and you can start to record playback view and, and manipulate the, you know, the signal data, the, the, the data that's, that's you know, out there traveling through the air. You can pick that up, you can analyze it, and, and you can work with that raw signal. You can then start to analyze and build your own components, right? So if, if we're looking, say, for example, at an 802.11, uh, device or an 802.11 enabled device, um, we can start to pull out some of the common message formats and, and populate some of the default values into the tools, which gives us a way to, to rapidly step through the crafting of our own packets, to, to build our own messages, to build our own um, sequences of messages and inject them back into the air and, and to the end target uh, with all of the components, all the pieces that they need. You know, it's got the, it's got the built-in scappy, we can calculate it our own CRCs, we can make everything look like it's supposed to or like it normally would look if it was coming from a, a, a real uh, node, but instead it's, it's our node, our software driven node. One of the big benefits that we see and, and one of the big use cases that we have for Fissure is, is fuzzing, right? So if you're, if you're looking at an RF signal and you're, you're trying to understand what it's doing, you can generate uh, an understanding of, of that protocol, representation of that protocol, but you still have to be able to change the data inside of the messages, you have to change the data that you're sending at the end target. Um, so there's a fuzzing component, an attack component for fuzzing that is built into Fissure that gives us the ability to change, you know, variables within the flow, flow graphs, uh, change data fields, and actually uh, do, you know, bit level fuzzing to, to craft our own messages, craft our own packets and send them uh, at the target. You know, and once again, these, these look exactly like they're supposed to. It's, it's built in a way that it's, it's scriptable, and uh, we can pretty much control everything that ends up being fuzzed uh, through that framework. Um, in addition to you know, the, the internal tools, uh, the, the, the tools that you know, we can, the, the fuzzing tools that we can use on the fly, there's a number of internal tools that we've built uh, for attack vectors, known protocols, uh, reference flow graphs, flow graphs that are from you know, previous uh, analysis, things that we've worked with, things that have you know, generic RF, features that we can pull data out of. You know, they're, they're stored internally. You can pull copies of them. You can pull information. You can use them for reference and, and actually build your own flow graphs uh, moving forward. And this, this evolves with the engineer. This evolves with the user as you progress and as you use the software. We are at a point where Chris has used this for, for a number of assessments in a number of, of years. Um, and, and we feel that the software is at a point where it's it's able to be open sourced, right? We're, we're reaching out and, and encouraging community collaboration. We're looking to expand the capabilities. You know, we know how we would use this tool and we know how we use the framework to do our day to day, but we know that we're not the only ones that are doing RF type work. And there's other individuals, other organizations within the community that could benefit from having this, this one-stop shop type interface to, to work with these SDRs and to do this sort of RF analysis. So we're looking to, you know, our next step is to, to put this out there and open it up for the community. Um, we also believe that there's, you know, significant uh, capability in, in task automation. Right? If, if we add machine learning uh, components to this and, and we add some recursive demodulation to, to analyze and tear those signals apart um, and help the user, help the analyst uh, start to, to understand what, what he's seeing on the screen, uh, we can definitely accelerate the, the analysis process. And in the long run, by accelerating the analysis process, we accelerate and improve the overall security of a system because we're providing a tool that makes the job, makes the analyst's job, the security specialist's job easier. Um, so what we'll do is we'll actually show you here uh, two examples of how Fissure can be applied. Um, the first example is 
uh, a simple X10 home automation system. It's a smart switch. You click the click the button on the switch, it throws the, the relay in the outlet, and it enables you know a smart home, a wireless connection to a light or to a, a component. Um, Chris will walk through the initial process of discovering the frequency, monitoring the signal, capturing and transmitting uh, data, and then doing some some replay attacks, replaying those captures. Uh, Analyzing the signal that's being replayed and understanding what each of the each of the components of that signal do, and then build a flow graph that we can then transmit and send our own signals. Right. So, uh, the first demo, Chris will walk through this whole process, and in the end, you'll actually see him craft his own uh, mess uh, message, send it through an SDR, and transmit it out to uh, the X10 switch and, and flip the switch on and off. Uh, the the second demo that we'll provide here is uh, a demonstration that's probably a little bit more um, relevant to the sorts of systems that, that we may work with. And that would be uh, collection and analysis of the ADSB or, or automatic dependent surveillance broadcast, right? The, the transmissions that go from plane to plane and plane to ground that, that are responsible for aircraft location and reporting. So with this example, with this demonstration, we'll go through the same process that we went through with the X10 will do the capture, we'll do the replay, we'll analyze the signal. But instead of, of just sending you know, a message, what we'll do is we'll actually feed that into the fuzzer and we'll have the fuzzer generate and modify data fields within that message and then transmit those uh, messages out. Um, now, obviously this is, uh, transmission of ADSB is not something that we want to do live. So we do have a, a canned video demo of that one because that's a little bit safer for us. But what I'll do is I will hand control over to Chris and uh, give him an opportunity to, to showcase his, uh, his tool. All right, I think we're good. Hi, I'm Chris Bohr from EIS. Now, before I go into the demos, I want to stress that I'm here today to receive input from you. So if you're just watching and you're sitting at your computer, I urge you to compose a new email right now and send it to 4C at AInfoSec.com. I want to hear from you. And uh, I want you to, I don't care if you're watching this live or a couple of weeks from now, I'd still want to hear your feedback and what you would want Fisher to do. So Fisher is designed to integrate existing tools quickly. And the more I hear from you, the, uh, the faster the development will be expedited. So the more, I, the more I hear, the better it's gonna be for everyone. So, you know, tell me about uh, technologies that you like to use, what kind of hardware you like to use, what RF protocols, operating systems, just general things that are of interest to you. I wanna hear about that. So as I mentioned, Fissure is a framework that allows you to do all these things, but it doesn't necessarily do all those things right now. So that's why I'm going to, as I go through the demo, point out certain areas that I could probably use some help. I don't wanna reinvent the wheel. If something exists already, I just wanna use it. So let's go into the software. Fissure has a nice little GUI that I'll launch here. And it'll pop up like so. So what you're seeing are a bunch of tabs and menu items that do different things. Uh, Fissure was originally designed for automatic RF device assessment. So you go into a place and you uh, scan your environment, see what's out there, what kind of devices are going on in the background. Maybe you'll see something you've never seen before and you wanna identify those signals and capture their characteristics and go back to your lab and analyze them and try to figure out what they are. And Fissure was initially designed to expedite that process, but it's grown into a lot more than that. You can incorporate other tools. Um, it allows you to, uh, aut allows automation in the process. Uh, Fissure is composed of just a bunch of Python components that communicate through like a central hub. So that allows you to do signal detection at one part of the country, uh, protocol discovery and another part, do attacks, have some guy controlling this interface at a different part. I mean, it allows for that, 
But today we'll just be going through the uh, RF device assessment process manually, just to give you an idea of what Fissure does and what you could do with Fissure. So today I got a lamp sitting next to me and uh, we'll be targeting this X10 device that Eric was talking about. It looks kind of like this. It's sitting right next to me. I don't know if you can see it, but it's a uh, Radio Shack uh, outlet switch controlled with a wireless remote here. I'll be turning the remote on and off by recording signals from the remote and uh, trying to just craft attacks that, that simulate this behavior. All right, so the first step in the process is to detect the signal to figure out where it is in the spectrum. Now, before we do that, I will have Fissure detect what hardware I have plugged into my computer. Right now, I have a USRP V210. So the nice thing about Fissure is that it will detect uh, IP addresses and serial numbers, and it, you can probe the hardware and uh, know more about what's connected to your computer automatically. And you can apply it to all the components and all the defaults will be set up for the B210 now throughout all the tabs. There is a slow scanning uh, feature for Fissure. Uh, I'll show you that right now. I know this device is around 300 megahertz. So we'll set up the scan. To do that, you can add multiple search bands and it will slowly scan the spectrum. And when I uh, press the off switch on this remote, you'll start to uh, see Fissure slowly detecting where it thinks the signal is. And it looks like it's reporting around 311, 312. And as it moves outside the scan, it's going to tail off here. So that's a very slow scanning feature. And I know what you're thinking, you're thinking that's not very useful. And I kind of agree. I mean, if the thing is just a quick burst, you'll miss it, you'll miss it. Or if it's hopping around, you may not get it while this is slowly scanning. So Fissure needs a fast scanning component. It doesn't have one right now, but if you have something that does that, I want to hear from you. So in lieu of that, Fissure will uh, support other people's tools. So what I got going on right now is this Q Spectrum Analyzer tool, and I have a HackRF hooked up to my computer, and it does the HackRF sweep, which is a really fast uh, spectrum scan. So now when I press the off switch on my remote, it will show up there on the left between 300 and uh, 320 megahertz around you know the north end of 310 so it's it's roughly where the slow scan was saying it is so that's the nice thing about fissure you can just use other tools it doesn't you don't have to use the core components of fissure you can just use the other tools separately so like if you want to load up open bts you can just install it as part of the install you click a button all the tabs show up and I'm even throwing in my own personal guides for using the thing. So if you don't know what those, those terminal windows do, I have a guide here that can help you run through and tell you, you know, what to put in each terminal. So something like this could take someone weeks to figure out how to do, but I can get you set up and running and guaranteed to work in just, you know, a couple of minutes really. So Fisher is designed to do everything for anyone, really. Uh, so a beginner would, would like this to stage their system and just be up and running without much work. You just select a couple of checkboxes on the install and you're good to go. And advanced people can integrate their tools into Fisher and do complicated things. So let's go back to the process. So we, we know roughly where this X10 remote is transmitting, but we still have to extract features from the signal to, uh, to, to classify it and, and know that it's a, an X10 device. So I built these inspection flow graphs that I'll start up. And this will just give me more detail about the signal. So I can change things like the sample rate, the frequency. Let's 
put it around 310. Now, when I press the remote, the signal will show up. And uh, that's, that's okay, but I could really use something that zooms out a little bit. So if I just keep one in every 10 samples, you'll kind of see that. Now you have a better picture of what's going on with the signal. I can zoom out even more. And that's what happens when I press the button down. You get a series of pulses that look like that. So let's look at it in more detail. I can stop it while it's running. All right, so something like this, we can zoom in. And this is what it's transmitting. That looks like some kind of wake up or a sink in the beginning. There's a little bit of a chirp on the, the front of it. It's changing frequency. But then there's a gap and there are a bunch of pulses. So uh, the Fissure framework would support automation of me. Fissure allows uh, a program to go in and just detect these, uh, these features that I'm manually just looking at. So if I wanna uh, determine these pulse widths, this frequency, there's nothing stopping me from writing a program and putting it into Fissure to do that. But right now we're just kind of walking through it manually. So once I have an idea of, of this information, I can uh, start to build up my own library of these features. And uh, if I've never seen this device before, you, you could uh, feed it into a protocol discovery piece where you'll look at something like this and maybe you'll have code that gives you a bit stream and you, you gotta make sense of that bit stream. So if you're just looking at this right now, can you tell what a one is and what a zero is? It, is it every pulse here, is that a one? Is this a zero? Or is there some other pattern to it? So that's where protocol discovery and pattern recognition comes into play. So if you have any code that does that kind of work, I wanna hear about it and I wanna integrate it into Fissure. Okay, so let's keep going in to extract more features about that, that signal. Fissure has a built-in recording tool, which will allow me to capture the signal that you just saw there and uh, do more in-depth analysis. So just change a few of these parameters, capture about a second worth of data, hit the record button, and I'll press the off button. That's pretty good. So that's the signal I recorded. And from here, I can do things like uh, just crop out one of these messages, just pick any one, a window, hit the range, plop the window. Yeah, looks pretty good. So it sends a series of those. So let's just save one of them. And drop the file. Here's the original file. And here's the drop version. And from here, you can do uh, analysis on it. You can look at the magnitude. It's pretty constant there. You can do a little spectrogram. You can see the little chirps at the beginning, but I don't think that's intentional in any, by any means. And uh, from here, you can replay the signal to know if there's any uh, counters or uh, any type of encryption, maybe things that would get in the way, timestamps of uh, me crafting the signal on my own. So there's a playback feature that will just remember what I used to record it with the settings. So if I turn this lamp on with the switch, it's like this. Now I replay that this file down here that I recorded, it should turn the lamp off. It does, that's good, that's great. Okay, so we know that this is the signal we want and we wanna craft it. Uh, it. We may not have enough information right away to just start crafting it. There's another step here where you can just look up things online. Maybe you know a little bit about the signal. Maybe you can look up the FCC ID. So uh, I've done that. And this is what you can find about X10 devices. And it looks just like our signal. You got a sync here and there's only four fields. If you guessed that a zero was a high and a low and a one was a high and three lows, you were right. But you may not have known that just by eyeballing. That's where that protocol discovery pattern recognition comes into play.
All right, so once you, you have this knowledge, you know your, your uh, signal features that you've measured, you know, things like bandwidth and frequency and pulse durations, you can start crafting attacks. And you, once you have this knowledge, you can first build up your library of that knowledge. So I have a little packet crafter here for uh, X10, and you can have the four fields there. You can change some of these values, do that, calculate the CRCs, string together a bunch of messages, uh, just manipulate the data however you like, whatever. So once you know things about your signal, you have it in your library, you can start crafting attacks for it. Uh, I have uh, attacks sorted by protocol, modulation type, and hardware. Now, these attacks don't even have to be flow graphs. They can just be Python scripts. I have lots of Wi-Fi attacks that I do that don't necessarily use SDRs. They'll use uh, wireless adapters in monitor mode or not even monitor mode, just connected to a network. So if you have any exploits for you know, just attacking things or any code for piping data to something else, you can easily run that in Fissure. And I do that a lot for Wi-Fi to do more advanced things. I'll take data generated from Fissure, pipe it into another flow graph that does something else, and I can do really complicated things. So back to the X10, uh, let's look at these uh, on and off attacks that I have here. They're constructed in GNU radio, which kind of looks like this. If you've never seen that before, it's just a bunch of blocks uh, that interface with the radio. So what I'm doing is I created my own block to generate the messages to simulate a button press for four seconds every 10 seconds. And it feeds right into the radio block and transmits it over the air. If you're wondering what this block looks like, it looks like this. I would feed it in parameters that I measured, like the intervals of things, the frequencies and whatnot. I would say what a one and a zero do in cases like this. And it's all Python code. It could be also in C++. And it's not much code to do all that. And the end result will look like this. I'll show you what happens when I run the attack. So if I want to start the attack and turn it on, move the lamp up. Switch over to the off attack, turn the lamp off. Perfect. Okay, so we're, we're going through the process. We have the ability to turn it on and off. We have it in our library. Now we can do more advanced things like uh, fuzzing. Since it's already in our library, we, have, we can choose different message types, select different fields, randomize the values in those fields, automatically calculate CRCs, generate the message every second or so. Uh, that's the whole process for an X10 device. Now, if we look at something more complicated, like the ADSB that Eric was talking about, mode S ADSB messages. So if we do the whole process for that, we're left with something like this, where we have lots of messages in our library. And they're not all necessarily the same length. It's a little more complicated than the X10, instead of, which had just four fields. Something like this has a lot. But I will show you a demonstration of me just fuzzing the latitude and longitude for uh, these values. And you'll see an aircraft be generated and fly around the world randomly. So well, let's get into that. So this is the, the uh, this is the same screen I was showing you earlier. We got the latitude and longitude uh, selected. Now I have dump 1090 running in the background, which is a program that detects ADSB signals and plots them on that. So when I hit start for the fuzzing, the plane will show up like that, and it'll fly around the world randomly. And I'm glad this is on a video and I'm not doing it while I'm at the airport. Normally, I just change the frequency, so it wouldn't, wouldn't matter anyway. 
So that's the, the whole process from end to end. There are lots of points where I could use uh, existing tools and, and things like that to plug it into Fissure, but it would be nice to get input from you. So if you remember that email I told you to write in the beginning, uh, there's my email again. I urge you to, to contact me or Eric and tell us uh, things that you're interested in and things that, I, that we could use and uh, maybe any opportunities we can work together at. Uh, this software will be open sourced eventually and I mean, look for it at our AIS GitHub or from the main website for open source projects. There might be a link there someday. Um, with that, I'll turn it over to any questions you may have. And uh, I also want to thank the Griffiths Institute and the you know, Bari Center for, uh, for hosting this. Is there, I mean, it's a typical range for RF that you're able to detect, right? So you, and is it directional? Um, you know, I try my ignorance on RF, but. Okay. Um, so you can use pretty much any type of hardware and plug it into the software. So if you have your own custom radio to do something, you could integrate it into this pretty flawlessly. It's been designed to use a lot of these commercial SDRs because that's widely available to a lot of people. And whatever, you, uh, whatever your setup is, I mean, you can customize it. You can use antennas plugged directly into an SDR. You can, you can wire them off for whatever you know, thing you're targeting. You can have special use cases and you can customize your hardware for those and still use the software. So it works in for any scenario that you're in. I mean, there are some limitations that you know it may be hardware dependent, but the software is flexible enough to uh, allow you to customize for whatever situation you're in for the most part. What about multiple uh, signal, multiple RF kind of going out at the same time that are very close frequency. You have a hard time separating the frequencies. So, so Fissure was designed to account for blind signal separation and things like that. Now it's not necessarily built into it at the moment. I don't have something developed to do that. It's all just basic uh, proof of concept kind of. But if you have the tools, the algorithms do that kind of thing, you can incorporate it into this framework pretty, pretty quickly. So if you have something that works already, whether it's MATLAB code or, or Python or C++ or whatever that you, you run in your, your lab somewhere, uh, this will let you put it into like a bigger package, bigger laboratory tool. So it kind of expands something that maybe you think is ready for, for something else. So what's your time frame for making it available on the you're good. Uh, that, that depends. Um, there are a few things I'd like to do to, to clean it up, to make it support more things. Um, but it depends on any feedback, feedback that we get from this or any interest that uh, we received beforehand. But it could be, you know, a few months. If Ideally, if we could release by end of summer, uh, that would be our, our best goal, or our best bet. questions? If we still have a couple minutes for questions, if, um, if we got some. Yes, yeah, so where can one find more information on its potential use of real-time network 
1941 cyber detection and exploitation used across multiple nodes of signal transmission spanning airspace cyber ENS, such as across satellite, general plane, and ground base station. Just more general information about the topics. Or, um, uh, it says more information on it potentially use. Oh, potentially use. Well, th this software does need some building up to be used in real time. Uh, there are, uh, I mean, right now it's a laboratory tool. There's a lot of automation currently going on. It's mostly manual, but if you want to, this thing is in its development. So as the as time goes on, and if we open source it and we build in more tools that already exist, it will do more advanced things like that. Uh, could it support something like that? Uh, yes, if the hardware allows it that you're plugging into it. If I just have a cheap radio, I mean, maybe you can't detect all these nodes and things like that at the same time. But if you have multiple radios going on and you uh, are set up in the right situation, uh, Fissure could support something like that. I mean, you could support the development of a flow graph that allows for collection on one interface and a transmission on another interface. Uh, obviously, you'd have to do some, some pre-processing, some, some analysis up front. But once you build the components, you can actually do the collection, you can do the transmission, and you can you know, do the, do the real-time work there. It just does require that upfront piece to understand, to, to understand the protocol and work with it. Uh, Chris, uh, this is awesome. Thank you for doing this. Um, you've envisioned this kind of sitting side by side with other tools like investing tools like Metasploit, or will this be integrated kind of as a an access mechanism to then go uh, deliver Metasploit stuff? I, like in the larger ecosystem, how do you sort of see this going? I imagine this tool. Uh, being used to uh, allow people to have a sense of familiarity. So I wouldn't want to just completely replace something like a Metasploit. But at the same time, if you have uh, if you have scripts or something that, that run Metasploit modules or, or things like that, I mean, you can call them from here, no problem. But you can, you can also do a lot of things that Metasploit does. So you can make your own scripts to, to exploit a, a device. There could even be a vulnerability assessment uh, component built into this where you throw something at a device and you kind of listen to see what's going on you know, to see if you had any effect on your target and stuff like that. But uh, I want to allow the integration as many tools as possible. And I don't necessarily want to alienate anyone who uses a tool that they, they like to use. At the same time, I want to get something that works, that's easy to use. Okay, I'd just like to thank everybody for attending this uh, virtual event. Um, if you'd like a copy of the slides, they're available on the GI uh, website under the GI Lecture and Education Series tab um, or link. Um, I'd also like to thank AIS and Eric and, and Chris for, for doing the uh, presentation and the, the great demo. Um, and I'd like to thank our sponsors, the GI, AIS, and the Inamari Advancement Center. Um, in closing, um, the next GI Lecture and Education Series event is planned for uh, May 26th at 11 o'clock. Our guest speaker will uh, be uh, Nicholas Ross Burke from AIS, and he'll be presenting uh, Git History uh, Hygiene.
So please check our website out and register for that event if you're interested. Uh, thank you.